Well, here we are. Joel made it sound like I'm living on the beach and got the flip-flops going and uh, honey, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> but I tell you what, there's no place I would rather be right now, no place I would rather be than right here. And I'm uh, thankful that you're here and that we're here together. Uh, praise team, thank you for that awesome job of leading us in worship. Uh, the cross, meant to kill, is my victory. And oh, the blood, what power is in those songs. What a, what a great start to our day. Has it been a great day so far? Great day? <laughs> have you already blown it? Some of you already said something you shouldn't have said or done something you shouldn't have done, maybe. You know, guys, uh, especially fellas and husbands in particular, we're, we're pretty good at that. Maybe you heard about the couple that was watching TV and a commercial came on. And, and the, the commercial was advertising a product that would help uh, people in their golden years live pain-free. And the 63-year-old wife turn, turned to her husband and she said, Am I in my golden years? And he said, Oh, honey, no way. But you're yellowing fast. <laughs> we wouldn't do that, would we? We wouldn't say that, guys, but what about this? Hopelessly romantic husband at a wedding reception, and he reaches over and he grabs his wife's hand gently and kind of squeezes it, and he leans over and says, Honey, you're better looking than half the women here. <laughs> and to some of us guys, we think, Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> that was pretty well said. But in case you're one that thought that was well said, let me clue you in. That special lady in your life doesn't want to hear that, okay? So just keep that one unsaid. But, uh, but we all need a do-over. It would be nice if this had a, had a reverse gear. Or if we could go back and wind the clock back and do some things over. But we can't. But what God does offer us is so special. God offers us an undeserved gift we're going to talk about an undeserved gift today, um, and we need that. Anybody here ever lied to a spouse? Crushed a child's feelings? Stolen somebody's dream? Borrowed something, maybe money, maybe an object? Borrowed something and never paid it back? Walked away from a promise that you made? Anybody ever done that? We all have regrets, and we all have that uh, weight of sin and that, and that regret that we carry with us for years in many cases. And I think each one of us, even after we become a Christian, even after we come to know the forgiveness of Christ, we know He's forgiven us, He's promised to do that, and we felt that forgiveness, but yet there's something deep inside of us that says, I still need to go back and make that wrong right. I need to correct it. Well, today, as we're in the book of Romans, we're studying uh, our, our, our series. In our series, the bottom line, we're in our third week, and we find ourselves today in the third chapter of Romans. And it's a very special part of Scripture, because here, we're, we're going to hear not how we can necessarily make things right, but we're going to hear how we can be made right through faith in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, when he looked at this passage of Scripture, he was so touched by what it says, this later paragraph in Romans 3, he said this is not only the central part of the book of Romans, but this is the central part of the entire Bible. And so we're going to look at that today as we continue our study of the bottom line. And the first thing we see as we look at a couple of verses is our first point today and that's that none of us are good enough. You probably weren't hoping to hear that when you came in this morning, but, but that's the truth, and we've got to be honest about that. And Paul tells us how that all unfolds. In the third chapter of Romans, beginning with verse 9, or beginning with verse nine he lets us know very clearly and plainly we're not good enough. This is what that selection of verses say. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? 
Not at all, he writes, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin, all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is none one, no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Uh, and, and all have turned away, and all together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul says we're all in the same boat. The ground is level. There is not one person more deserving than anybody else, whether we're Jew or Gentile, whether we have a hedonistic past or legalistic past. We're all in the same position. We've all sinned. And all of us know the pain of sin. A mom understood that clearly when she was in the kitchen and she heard from the front room her four-year-old son scream. And she went and what's wrong? And he says, she, his two-year-old sister, she pulled my hair and it hurt. Mom patted him on the head and said, oh, she was just playing. She didn't know that pulling hair hurt. And goes back in the kitchen. She had just gotten in the kitchen when she heard the little girl scream. Now what's wrong? And the little boy hollered from the front, it's okay, Mom. Now she knows that it hurts. <laughs> we all know the pain that comes by sin, and we all want to make it right. Unless you're just a, a little brother or sister. You want to make it right. There's, um, we all know that pain. And so from... The middle of Romans chapter 1, through the end of that chapter, all the way through chapter 2, and from chapter 3 up through verse 20 or so, Paul lays out this case, and he makes it clear that he's the prosecuting attorney, and he puts all of humanity on trial, and he's making it clear that we're all sinners. He's making it clear that there is not one single person, not one, that's good enough. That none of us are good enough to earn God's favor on our own. None of us are deserving. There are no scales out there anywhere that at the end of time, when we stand before God, we put all the good on one side and all the bad on the other, and God looks at those scales and says, okay, you're in. Those scales don't exist. And so up to this time, for the last 64 verses, Paul has been saying, there's some bad news. And you need to understand, none of us are good enough. And he presents this case with indisputable evidence. But that brings us, thankfully, to our second point. It all changes with the first two words of verse 21, where Paul says, but now, but now, the, the, the verse goes like this, verse 21 of chapter 3, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So this verse, verse 21, is an important verse of transition where Paul has been giving us all this bad news, this heavy stuff, that hurtful stuff, but then he changes it, but now. Now, he had to give us the bad before we could really appreciate the good. Think of it this way. Now, you may need to use your imagination, but think about me up here with a parachute. I've got a parachute, and I spend 30 minutes telling you, convincing you, trying to convince you how much you need this parachute, telling you how it works, and giving you some emotional stories about how people that needed a parachute didn't always have a parachute with tragic consequences. And uh, I, I tell you all about this parachute, but it doesn't really seem very relevant to you. You kind of hear me telling you about the benefits of the, of the parachute, and you kind of receive it with a yawn. And I know why. Because you're on the ground. It doesn't seem like such a big deal. When you're on the ground, you can hear this good news all the day long about the parachute, but it just doesn't really mean much. But you change the context, and all of a sudden, that really does sound like good news. That same old news, the same stuff, sounds like really good news when you change the context. You're in a small plane in the back of the small plane, and you hear the pilot up front say two words. He says, uh, close. <laughs> he says, Mayday. 
May Day. We're losing power, we're going down. And you can feel the little plane start to go down. So you pull out your cell phone and you start texting for all your worth. Sayonara, hasta la vista, uh, comanchero, uh, whatever you're typing because you know it's goodbye. You know you're not going to survive, you're not going to make it, you're not going to spell sayonara right. It's not going to happen. And then all of a sudden I tell you, hey, I've got an extra parachute if you're interested. And all of a sudden, that same news sounds much better because you know, you understand things are bad. And Paul has been writing for 64 verses now that things are bad. We're all sinners, and here's what we deserve because our sins have separated us from a holy God. And in verse 21, Paul says, but now, now things can be different. And at the church, here in this place, in other churches, we spend a lot of time necessarily talking about uh, presenting the good news. And that's a good thing. But if we don't at least first give the bad news the good news won't really seem all that special. And it's not until we understand the situation, how bad the situation is, that we can appreciate the good news. I love the truth of this statement. The degree of news being good is based on our understanding of how bad the situation is. And we understand that. We understand that clearly. It, it, we're not really needing a life preserver unless we are standing in an ocean vessel in the middle of the ocean, and that thing is going down. So at church, we talk a lot about the sinfulness of man and failures and our needs, but we always try to do that in the context of Scripture to point people to the, to the solution, to the cure for that. It's always pointing people to Jesus because it helps us understand when we talk about our sins and our failures, it helps us understand how great is our need. And Paul, in this 21st verse, says, but now. And then he talks about righteousness, and that's a word that we know. That's a word that we understand. It means proof of value or proof of worth. Our uh, school term, for the most part in this area, ended a few weeks ago. And our graduating seniors, some of them, had applied to a college or multiple colleges and the colleges, when they receive these applications, they go through them and, and try to determine who is worthy, who, is, who, who would bring value to our university, who would accept the value of the university. In other words, are these students righteous enough? And so they ask for some proof. What, what's your GPA? What's your, uh, uh, your, your, your test scores? Give me some recommendations, some references. What are your life experiences? They want to know, is this student what is their proof of worth? What is their proof of value? Or if you're applying for a, a line of credit, you're wanting to buy, purchase a car or a house, and you apply for a, a loan. The bank has you fill out a credit application, and on that, you're saying, see, here is my proof of worth. Here is my righteousness that you hope will get you that loan. That's what, it's, that, that's what it means. And Paul for all of these verses, has laid out the, the case <laughs> that none of us are righteous. So he spent three chapters writing basically a rejection letter. Your application isn't approved. You're not going to be admitted. Uh, your application's been turned down, but now, but now, this righteousness is available. That's from God. Not that you've earned it by keeping all the rules and, and following all the laws, but it's something given by a God who loves you. And it's given through faith in Jesus Christ, not based on your moral record or your religious resume. It's from God. And many folks are burdened, burdened by thinking, if only, if only I was better if I had done more good things, if I had made better choices, if I were a better person, then God would accept me. But here's the gospel, and hang, hang with me here for a moment. The gospel says, because that's not the gospel, the gospel says you can't possibly do enough. 
The gospel says you can't earn your way. You can't be righteous enough on your own. But it's a gift from a God who loves you through faith in his son. Which brings us to our third point, and that is this gift is available to all who believe. Don't you love that? Verses 22 and 23 of Romans 3, as we move on, says this. The righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, and there is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul is reminding us once again, and it's helpful to know that we're all in the same position. We all need his righteousness. We're not good enough. He says we've all sinned. It's an archery term. It's like a target has been set up, and no one is hitting the target. God sets it up, and we all miss that target. We look around and think, well, I I got closer than, than he did. I certainly got closer to the target than she did, and we're tempted to think if we get closer than anybody else, then we're okay, but stop it. Because God says we're not good enough. Paul went over that thoroughly. No one hits the target. We don't meet his standards. We don't even meet our standards, let alone the standards of a holy God. A few years ago, I went uh, to Damascus, Maryland to run a, a trail race. And you, you never know what kind of weather you're going to get. You register for these things weeks and sometimes months ahead of time, and you get what you get. And on race morning, it was pouring the rain. And it had been raining for four consecutive days constantly prior to the race. Now again, trail race. It was filthy, nasty, muddy. And as we gathered there in the start line or starting area to get the the last minute instructions, I noticed these two girls, and I kind of heard what they were saying. These two girls are right in front of me, young girls, and they looked like they had just walked out of a makeup session. I thought that was kind of funny. You would look at them, and it looked like everything was pinched and pressed and padded just right. Uh, Everything the liner was on, they were looking good. Their shirts matched their shorts. They matched their shoes. They all looked brand new. And you couldn't tell if they were going to go run or go shopping. You just couldn't tell. And you could tell by what they were saying that they weren't going to get muddy. Now, if if, if we just kind of be careful where we go and we, we navigate our steps just right, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll come out just as clean and, you know, they, they were going to be, they were going to be just fine. And I'm thinking, I'm, to myself, it's 26 miles of mud. <laughs> just, ex, just expect to, to get dirty. And we all did. Just about a mile in, just about one mile in, the, the, the trail crossed a creek. And it was a kind of a steep bank down, and again, it's pouring the rain, steep bank down to the creek, and you cross the creek, and a steep bank up on the other side. And you could challenge that if you want, but just fortunately, there was a a tree that had fallen some years before, pretty close to that, and so that log was still across the creek. And some of the more daring runners were crossing that log, and I was daring for about three or four steps. And then I uninjured myself right off that tree into the thick, wet ooze of the creek bank. And that was just really at the beginning of the race. So I had already gotten my full complement of brown pretty quickly. But we just went on and, and just, just kept going. And, and, and one thing that kind of brought a little smile to my face once in a while was the thought of way behind me, those two clean girls and an army of other runners were covered in that same stuff. Somewhere back there, way behind me, they were all just like me. Well, when I finally get to the finish line, there's already about 100 finishers ahead of me, including the two clean girls. <laughs> Ooh, I, I don't mind getting beat by girls. That happens all the time. Happens, it happens every time. But that one in particular really got me. But the thing that made it a little easier to take was their Maybelline metallic cream pearl had been replaced with a half inch of uh, of essence of sludge. It was great. Uh, But you can imagine, you can kind of imagine the setting there. We were, everybody, everybody there was just filthy, dirty, 
Uh, and you might look at a few people around and say, yeah, buddy, I'm not nearly as dirty as you are, and, you know, get, get that stink behind me. But I'm covered, I'm covered in mud. It would be totally pointless for anybody to look around and say, you know, com compared to this guy, I, I'm really not too bad. And I know I've got that wedding to go to here in a little bit, so I don't think I really need to take a shower. I'll just, I'll just change clothes and I'll be all set to go. No. Everybody's in the same position. Everybody's dirty. Everybody needs a shower. It's just true for all of us. We're all dirty, and the Bible talks about the fact that we're all in this position. Even the righteousness, that little bit of righteousness that we have is like filthy rags compared to a holy, pure, 100% righteous God. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before him. And Paul says, look, we're all in that same position. We all need to be cleansed. And we can't cleanse ourselves. We've fallen short of God's standard, which brings us to the fourth and final point. Justification and redemption come from Jesus. They come from him. Let's look at the third chapter where we've been and go to verse 24. And this is what it says. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Notice that we're justified freely. Freely. And it's all because of him. It, it's through him. Now, when we think of justified, again, that's another church word that we, we will use some. And we have an idea what that means. We kind of think a synonym for justification would be uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness is a part of that, or, or pardon is a part of that. We're pardoned freely. We freely uh, receive his uh, forgiveness. And, and those are a part of the justification concept, but that doesn't go far enough. Just, just, just pardon and forgiveness don't go far enough. See, justification isn't just God forgiving a debt that we've racked up. He does that, but it's also uh, God giving us the riches of Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? So when we talk about being justified, it's not that we stand before God and he forgives our sin. He replaces that with the righteousness of Jesus. The word is imputed. It's credited to our account. Um, so we're not just forgiven. We receive the righteousness of Jesus. And when we stand before God, we're standing there with his righteousness. It's been given freely and is credited to our account. Look at verses 25 and 26. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. His death on the cross was this moment, this point, that the atoning sacrifice was made through the shedding of his blood. It's received by faith, so God is both just and the justifier. Doesn't that remind you of what John, John the Baptist uh, screamed in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 29, when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I've heard the, the, the Gospel presented uh, sometimes with the word picture of a courtroom, and maybe you've heard about this in some flavor or another. It's like a courtroom where we stand before God one day on Judgment Day. And uh, the Bible says we're called to give an account of our life. And as the image goes... God gets this big document. It looks like there's thousands of pages there, and our name is on the outside. And we just know that within the pages of that document is a record of every wrong that we've ever done. Our name is on the outside. But the good news of the gospel would say it this way. 
God pulls out this big document, and you think it's full of everything that you've done wrong, but instead, it's filled with everything that Jesus did right. Your name is on the outside, but it's his answers on the inside. His answers. You have his righteousness. That's what Paul is saying in the 26th verse of this same chapter, Romans 3, when he says, he is the one who justifies those who have faith in him. So it's his righteousness that's imputed to us. But also, our sin is credited to him. That's another way of saying what Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, this wonderful verse, this glorious verse, but God made him who had no sin, which is Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. I want you to understand what that means. That means that God put all the wrongs that we did upon Jesus, who had never done anything wrong, so that we could receive his righteousness. So that we could receive his righteousness. It means that Jesus was punished. He took the punishment as though he did everything wrong that we've committed. So that we could stand before God looking as though we have done everything right that Jesus has done. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that an awesome God? And then three chapters later, in Romans 6, verse 23, our, the last verse I want to share, Paul summarizes it all this way. The wages of sin is death, and that's what we deserve. That's the consequences of our actions is death. Jesus took that, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Do you remember, maybe you do, and you may have to just kind of imagine that this is the way it was at one time, but Sunday school dinners, probably before air conditioning or pic picnic dinners, um, and, and the church would say, okay, let's go to the community park. We're going to meet over there Saturday at 4.30. You bring your supper. We'll provide the tea. Just come on and join us. And on Saturday, you, you plan to go, but you get busy doing some other things, and at the very last minute, you remember the picnic. And so you rush home to get your supper together, only to find the only thing you can find is a dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the jar that you get it all over your hands when you try to get it out and two stale pieces of bread. But you put that bologna sandwich together, you drop it in a brown bag and off you go to the church picnic. And when it comes time to eat, you sit at the end of the table and there are great folks that come and sit right beside you, and that lady is just the fantastic cook. She's been in the kitchen all day, and she's made the fried chicken, and, and she has baked beans, a potato salad, homemade rolls. She sliced the tomatoes. She's got olives and pickles. Uh, she's got it all. There's celery there, and she topped it off with two... <laughs> Two big homemade chocolate pies. And they're sitting right there beside you and your dry bologna sandwich. And then they say, let's put it all together. And you think, oh, I, I don't deserve that. I couldn't do that. And you murmur uh, through an embarrassing response. But they say, oh, come on. We've got plenty of chicken. We've got plenty of chocolate pie. We've got plenty of everything. <laughs> and we just love bologna sandwiches. Let's put it all together. And so you did. And you sit there eating like a king when you came like a pauper. And when I think about that, I think, who am I? to share in the righteousness of a holy God. Who am I to accept this beautiful gift that he offers when I bring so little righteousness to the table? And he brings it all, and he invites me. <laughs> he invites me to share. I know that should just fill my soul with song and praise, but I am, in, I am just in awe 
and wonder to the point I think I can barely be heard. Now, I don't know about you. Well, I think I do. You don't have enough love and wisdom. You don't have enough grace and mercy like me. You surely don't have enough righteousness. But he does. He does. He has all those things in abundance. And he says, let's put them all together because everything that I possess, it's available to you. And it's tragic to think so many people are running through this life, hang on to their righteousness like a stale bologna sandwich, saying, God's not going to get my sandwich. No siree, this is mine. You ever see anybody like that? Are you somebody like that? So needy? half starved to death, but hanging on for dear life. You see, it's not, it's not that he needs your sandwich. You need his chicken. And when we start to understand that, it changes the way we live out our faith because we don't have to earn God's blessing. We'll never be good enough for that. We'll never be clean enough for that. But the blessing says we receive it through an active faith in Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me as we pray, please? Will you stand? God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the grace that drips from its pages. And Lord, if we ever needed a Savior, if anyone needed a Savior, that would be us because our righteousness accounts us nothing. It doesn't even amount to, to anything on the scales of life. But Lord, your righteousness, thank you forever. Thank you eternally for that offer and for the price you paid on Calvary to make that available. And Lord, today, if there are those in our presence who have never accepted that parachute, never trusted in the good news of Christ, never stepped out in, in faith, obedience, stepped into the waters of baptism, we pray that today that they'll receive your grace. They'll receive the righteousness that comes from, from knowing Jesus, that you'll take their sin, replace it with your righteousness, and make them clean today because of Christ. Give us the strength right now to honor you, we pray in Jesus' name. This morning, if you've... Maybe claim Christ as your Savior. You've expressed that faith, but never, never stepped into the waters of baptism. We invite you today to do that. We want to help you do that today and pray that you will. Maybe you want this to be your church home. This is your church family. Can be. Man, we'd love for you to step up and say, I want to be with you. I want to grow here. I want to give here. I want, I want to be challenged by you. Then we ask you to come. Maybe you just want to ask for prayer. I'm going to be over here to your right. Joel's going to be to the left. Now, if you want us to pray with you, we'd be glad to do that. Just come see one of us. If you want to pray privately, this area is yours. We ask you to do that. But whatever it is, we ask you to honor God and respond to the Spirit, we pray, as, as we sing together.